following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Happiness is a term that is highly debatable. But of course, when we study any form of spirituality or follow any kind of religious belief, happiness is a core motivation. in any pursuit that we have in life. We always have the pursuit of happiness. And as the Dalai Lama has pointed out repeatedly, it's because as human beings, this is the state that we all want to achieve. It's to find and experience a sustained form of happiness. But if we were to make a survey and investigate how people define happiness, we would find a huge disparity and huge contradictions in the definition of this term. In general, we could say that people typically define happiness as a state of safety and contentment within which there is no disease, no sickness, no illness, no poverty, no fear of pain, and a place and time and state in which we and our loved ones can persist in this experience. And interestingly, some people would define happiness as seeing their enemies suffer. So while they themselves have security and peace, contentment, fulfillment, their enemies would suffer the opposite. But real happiness is something that, according to Gnosis, according to the esoteric doctrine, that no person on this planet, or we should say rather very few people on this planet, have truly experienced. What we qualify as happiness, what we call happiness, is not true happiness. In fact, if we looked in the dictionary at the definition for the word happiness, we would find that the definition provided is generally dependent upon circumstantial materials, circumstantial factors, things that are impermanent. So, for example, some of us might say we experience happiness when we have some money in the bank 
or we experience happiness when our child is doing well. Or perhaps we experience happiness when we're passing our classes, when we're making good grades, or if our boss is happy with our performance, or if we're going to get a raise or some advancement in our career. Perhaps we find happiness when we're becoming famous or successful in business. But in any of these cases, they are all impermanent. None of them can last. And this key truth reveals the true nature of what happiness actually is. To acquire a state of real happiness implies that we would have to find a form of happiness that was not dependent upon circumstances. And where can we find that? Usually what we describe as states of happiness are states that temporarily arise and then pass away in one of our three brains. Of course, in Gnostic psychology, we always talk about the three brains. And these are three machines, three components that process information in a given way. The intellectual brain is that part of our psychology where we think, where we reason, where we analyze based upon logic, based upon comparison. Sometimes, some of us find happiness when we discover a new teaching, a new idea, or a new doctrine, and we become very enamored of it, very enthusiastic about it. And we find great satisfaction in our intellect with the contemplation of this idea or this theory. And we may find states related to the intellect that we would call happiness. States in which we feel a kind of contentment in the mind because of books or because of theories or because of ideas that we acquire. And these states in the intellect can also be ideas about ourself. They can be ideas about our own identity or ideas about who we are in life. But in this intellectual sphere, there's always a contradictory idea. There's always a contradictory theory. As beautiful and as well-designed as any theory is, it always is opposed by one equally beautiful. The intellect is a machine that can only process duality, A versus B, yes versus no, thesis versus antithesis. And because of this, those of us who have our psychological idiosyncrasy in the intellect are always in a pendulum swing, back and forth between A and B. And that pendulum swing can occur in a few minutes, in a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years. But inevitably, when we're looking to find happiness in the intellect, we will be disappointed. And this is because nothing in relation to the intellect is permanent. Ideas come and go. Theories come and go, like fashion. One week, all the scientists are saying, this is the way it is. And a week later, they say, no, it isn't. It's like this, the opposite. And we can see this is true in physics, in nutrition, in biology, in chemistry, in many different fields of materialistic science. We find a comparable phenomena when we look at our emotional brain 
and those of us who have a psychological idiosyncrasy related to how we feel about things. Those who are more emotional by nature seek happiness as an emotional state. And this happiness could be any variety of emotions that we would call joy, fulfillment, contentment, peace, even what we would call love. But in each of these cases, we would see that they're all conditional. For example, we may feel great contentment in our job, in our work, <clears throat> so long as we're receiving praise from our superiors or our coworkers. But as soon as they start to criticize us or to be indifferent to us, we become unhappy. The same can be true of a relationship. If you have children, you may have children who one day love and appreciate you and all your efforts, and the next day are indifferent, and maybe the day after that are cruel. And if you're relying on that scenario to provide you with happiness, you will inevitably dis be disappointed. And that's because you're placing your dependence upon an external circumstance which is impermanent and which cannot be relied upon. Further, it cannot be changed. We have this idea that we can change our external circumstances if we work hard enough or if we find a certain trick or a certain method. And we tend to go through life in this way. We think, well, if I get a better job, I'll make more money, and then I'll be happier. Or if I move to a better city, I'll be in a nicer environment, and then I'll be happier. Or if I find a new spouse, then they'll be nicer to me, and I'll love them, and then I'll be happy. But in each of these cases, we're seeking to change something external. And we fail to realize that the source of happiness or misery is inside of us. It's in our own mind. With the motor instinctive sexual center, which is related with instinct, with habits, and with our sexual energy, we also find that we look for happiness in this part of our psyche. The most common is sexual. And our media and our environment greatly encourage the idea that we can find happiness through, through common sexuality, through the way sexuality is understood and practiced by humanity now. But of course, the evidence proves otherwise. If happiness were really based upon the way sex is understood by humanity now, human beings would be happy. Marriages would last. Families would be strong. Adultery would be unheard of. But instead, we have the opposite. We have a humanity that is addicted to sensual indulgence. And because of that addiction, is always seeking more and more intense forms of sexual sensation. And because of this, no one is happy in a marriage or in a relationship because after a while they get bored. They start to look elsewhere for satisfaction. They may start to look in places that are so-called forbidden. And this is how crime originates. This is how marriages become true hells because of desire. But this kind of Reliance upon sensation is not merely sexual. Related to this brain, we also have the craving for security or safety. This desire or this uh, idea that we can find happiness, for example, if we build a certain amount of wealth, and then we feel that that wealth will be a safeguard against poverty or illness. But this is rather short-sighted especially if you consider the state of the world that we're in, that wealth is no guarantee, either of health or long life or happiness. In fact, many wealthy people are miserable. In many countries, there are people who built up a great deal of wealth only to have it disappear overnight because of war, because of economic changes, 
because of karma. So spending one's lifetime building wealth is no sure way to find happiness. Neither is spending one's lifetime in pursuit of sexual satisfaction, nor is it through finding fame, through finding the approval of others. All of these different methods fail to satisfy. And this is why life is the way it is. All the human beings on the planet crave happiness, search for happiness. But how many have found it? How many have found a happiness that is unconditional, that is not dependent upon little changes in circumstances? Truthfully speaking, we're very weak psychologically. We get a little illness and we become miserable. We get a little criticism and we become enraged or hurt. We don't have a strong psychological foundation. We're easily manipulated by our emotions, by our instincts, and by ideas. And this is because we haven't developed what's called a psychological center of gravity. And a psychological center of gravity really just means a firm foundation around which we gravitate psychologically. As we are now, we have our psychological center of gravity disequilibriated. So from one moment to the next, we're passing from one of the three brains to another. Impulse of fear to an impulse of shame to an impulse of pride to an impulse of lust. Always driven from one fear to another fear to another fear, from one form of suffering to another. And this is sad but it is, unfortunately, the way things are. If we want a fundamental change in our lives, we have to first abandon the false notion that we can find happiness through one of the three brains. In other words, through emotional situations, through intellectual situations, or through motor instinctive or sexual situations. Because all of these depend upon impermanent circumstances that really we have no control over. We don't really have any control over the outside world. And as hard as we work, there's no guarantee that we'll succeed if we are always focused on the external. And you can see this quite easily. When you see, for example, two businessmen, both work hard, but one is successful and one is not. And there's no visible reason for that except karma. Karma is a big factor here. Karma is the underlying cause of our suffering. And karma is simply the law of action and consequence. What we experience is because of what we are. Our external circumstances are produced by what we are as a psyche, as a mind. And thus the answer becomes, if we want to change our circumstances, then we should need to change ourselves. One of the greatest figures in our entire history who changed the course of the world and changed the lives of millions upon millions of people didn't set out to do that. He only set out to change himself. And this was the Buddha. He didn't set out to change the world, to find followers, or to even try to help anyone else. The first thing he did was to investigate the nature of his own mind. As he recognized that that is where suffering springs from, is our own mind. And therefore he saw that if he can change that mind, he can change his experience of life. And he did it. And we find the same case with all of the prophets with all of the Buddhas, with all of the teachers who've taught Gnosis, whatever name humanity knows it by. And this is the essential basis of any real mystical tradition or esoteric doctrine. We have to revolutionize our mind. And that's how we conquer suffering. And that, in turn, is how we can help other people. To do that, 
we have to first recognize that there is something to us that is beyond the three brains or beyond this psychology that we're currently uh, hypnotized by. There's something more than just this intellect, more than just emotion, more than just instinctive or sexual impulses or habitual impulses. And this something is called the consciousness. Consciousness is a word that gets used a lot. But understanding what it is requires something more than just an intellectual definition or more than just a belief in the heart and more than just acceptance or rejection of it as a motor or instinctive action. Consciousness has to be experienced. Each of us has a certain degree or portion of consciousness available to us, and that's why each of us is here listening. We have a certain amount of consciousness, but that consciousness has many states, many levels, or potential levels, we would say. And those potential levels are mapped on the tree of life. The whole tree of life, the whole Kabbalah, is a diagram of states of consciousness. And you see the same thing in the Baba Chakra, which is the wheel of samsara, or the wheel of life from the Buddhist tradition. This is also just a map or diagram of states of consciousness. As we are now, we're trapped in the wheel of samsara. This is the wheel of life, or the wheel of suffering, which is a wheel that constantly repeats itself because of karma. We can see that repetition in our own lives the way we seem to run around in circles with the same kinds of problems, the same kinds of conflicts, the same kind of unresolved issues in our lives. But what's worse is that we don't see that this cycle repeats from existence to existence. And that's because karma is a law, action and consequence. Karma is an energy that needs to be satisfied. That's all it is. It's very scientific. When we can grasp in ourselves what our unconsciousness is and start to utilize it, then we can find the key, the key that opens the door to real happiness. The consciousness is something that we hear a lot about. If you've studied any kind of uh, contemporary mysticism or spiritual approach, you'll often hear this phrase, be here now, be in the moment, be present. This is called mindfulness or watchfulness. And this is, of course, the very initial step because it's the consciousness that becomes present. It's the consciousness that gives us the ability to perceive sensation, to perceive anything. And our own consciousness is what we need to activate in order to find happiness and to overcome suffering. But this is not something that comes automatically. Our own consciousness at the moment is asleep. And this is proven to anyone who sincerely undertakes the effort to watch themselves, to observe themselves. If you really, seriously, and sincerely start to pay attention to your experience from moment to moment, from day to day, you'll discover not only how many contradictions you have in your mind, but also that you have no continuity. That from one moment to the next, you contradict yourself. And that from one day to the next, or one hour to the next, you forget the thing that you intended to do an hour ago, or a day ago. And this is how we'll start a diet and abandon it. We'll start taking a medicine and then we'll abandon it. We'll start a new idea or a new job or a new endeavor and then we'll abandon it. Or we'll fall in love and then one minute, the next minute we're not in love anymore. And this is the inconsistency of all the different egos or eyes that fill our mind. The consciousness is not the one that's in charge. And this is the problem. 
It's all those conflicting wills, conflicting desires that produce suffering. And that cause us to be in the horrible situation that we're in. So the first step to changing that <clears throat> is to become conscious. To establish our consciousness as our center of gravity. This means to be constantly watchful from moment to moment without ever stopping. Watching our three brains. Always aware of what thoughts are arising, what emotions are arising, and what impulses to action are arising. And then to consciously choose how to deal with them. As we are now, we don't. We are very impulsive, each in our own way. Those who are more in the motor instinctive sexual brain as their psychological idiosyncrasy are the most impulsive of all. They will perform actions without taking the time to feel what they feel about it or to think about it. These are the kind of people that will impulsively get into a fight, that will impulsively get into a relationship, that will impulsively run out and spend a lot of money, and then later they'll realize what they felt or thought. There are other types of people who are more emotional, who will only act on emotional impulses without thinking. And in this case, they may buy something because they want the emotional feeling of feeling good about having bought something. Or they'll make agreements to do things because they want to feel needed or they want to feel important or they want to feel like they're making an effort to support a person or a friend. But then later they won't do it because that feeling will change. Then there's the intellectual person who will only do something after they've thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and have all kinds of reasons. So, of course, this person is the slowest to act. Each one suffers great conflicts and great sufferings because in their hypnotism to one aspect of their own psychology, they fail to see the other two. But worst of all, is they fail to be conscious of what they do. And we all do this. And this is how we can see in our lives that we make decisions and then later realize the mistake. Or we make decisions and then later realize we should have done it differently. We should have done something else. With the consciousness awake, this ceases to be a problem. Someone who has their consciousness awake is able to see how the egos work through the three brains. And someone with the consciousness awake is able to receive guidance from their own inner Buddha, their own inner spirit. And in this way, they're able to guide the boat of their life through the treacherous waters of this world and avoid problems. To reach that, we have to awaken. As we are now, we're trapped in our karma and we suffer. We suffer because we're in ignorance. We don't know what's going to happen even later today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a great uncertainty in life. We suffer because we have desires that we can't satisfy. And we suffer because we fail to renounce those desires. We fail to realize that desires can never be satisfied. As much as you feed a desire, it will only want more. And this is a cause of suffering. And we also suffer because of the consequences of our actions. Because we act in ignorance. The consciousness when it's awakened, is able to circumvent these kinds of problems. So we need to know how to awaken it. The first thing I already mentioned is to be present, to make the continual effort to be in the moment, to be present, to be watchful of our own selves. But that's not enough. Being present is essential, but it cannot solve our problems. So those schools and teachings that emphasize being present are off to the right start. But you need something more than that. You can be perfectly aware that you're suffering, but you still suffer. 
How do you remove suffering? We have to remove the causes. And the causes of suffering are not outside of us. They're inside. As an example, if someone criticizes you or is gossiping about you, it's painful. But it's not painful because of what the person has said. It's painful because we have pride. If pride wasn't there, their words would have no meaning. It would be like air, like a wind. The same is true of greed or lust or fear. If those elements were not within us, then no matter what the circumstances are, we wouldn't suffer. We wouldn't suffer because of our pride or our shame. We wouldn't suffer because of our envy or our resentment. This is how we can understand the great sufferings of the saints, of the great masters and Buddhas of the past, when they suffered even martyrdom and torture and remained serene and remained capable of expressing great love for the ones that were torturing them. And this is because that individual, that saint, that master, did not have resentment or pride inside. This is something for us to reflect on. A friend of mine once was asked, doesn't your wife make you angry? And my friend said, no, my anger makes me angry. And this is the right answer. So the first step then is we have to first discover the causes of suffering. And they're within us. We need to remove them. We need psychological death. Psychological death, or mystical death, is the first of the three factors Psychological death is symbolized by John the Baptist in the Bible, in the Gospels. John the Baptist is decapitated in the story. And this is a symbol that we need the I, the ego, to die. And this terrifies many students of religion and spirituality. Because to speak of the death of the I scares the eye. It terrifies the ego. And many, when they approach religion or spirituality and they hear of the death of the eye, they become terrified and leave. And this is very unfortunate. This type of person is not realizing that it is their own eye that's causing their pain. It's their own ego that causes others to suffer. When that ego is removed, suffering is removed. When we learn how to be watchful of ourselves, to observe ourselves, really what we're learning is about how our mind functions. We're learning how our own ego controls our consciousness and puts it to sleep. And the ego does that by speaking and by giving impulses that put us to sleep, that hypnotize us. The ego is very seductive. Our own eye, or many eyes, will speak sweetly into our three brains in order to lull us into a psychological sleep. And it does this through fantasies, through daydreams, through worry about the future, through regret for the past, or through longing to repeat the past. Many tools that the ego uses in order to keep us from eliminating it. But inevitably, spiritual development requires that the ego be discarded. Those who have a belief in heaven would like to think and believe that one day, perhaps when they die, they will ascend to heaven. But this is not possible so long as we contain within ourselves pride and lust and fear and avarice. These elements cannot ascend to heaven. Only the consciousness that's free and pure can enter into a heavenly state. But when we talk about heaven, 
we were to use a Sanskrit term, we would talk about nirvana. Nirvana is contrasted with samsara. Samsara is used to describe the varying states of suffering that recur throughout our existence and throughout our many existences. Nirvana means the cessation of suffering, the end of suffering. So we would say then that happiness is nirvana. But the end of suffering or the arising of nirvana can only occur when the cause of suffering is no longer there. We can taste that when the consciousness is fully active. This is why we learn to meditate. Meditation is a way of utilizing the consciousness and extracting it from the ego. When you hear the word samadhi, this is a state of ecstasy, which is defined by the consciousness being free of the I. There are many states of samadhi, innumerable variations of samadhi. But samadhi itself is simply the natural state of the mind, the natural state of the consciousness without any ego. And it's a state of bliss. It's a state of happiness. It's a state of nirvana. But in us, let's say, for example, that we learn how to meditate very well. We learn how to enter into samadhi. We learn how to extract the consciousness from the ego during our practice of meditation. And in that way, we experience that ecstasy. This is not enlightenment. Unfortunately, some yogis and practitioners believe that it is. But this is clearly proven to be false because this is a temporary state. It's temporary. The ego is still there. All that happens is that meditator has extracted their consciousness briefly, experiences a state of bliss, a state of ecstasy, but then is pulled back into that ego when the experience subsides. And so it is impermanent. It is not enlightenment. It is not liberation. It's temporary. What that meditator needs to learn is how to destroy the cage the cage that has trapped their mind, their consciousness. And that is the process of psychological death. That process is symbolized in Tibetan Buddhism by Mahakala, who's a great, wrathful deity who tramples upon the ego, who conquers afflictive emotion, who destroys the I. And that force is also symbolized in many other ways, in many other traditions, in the Greek mysteries by Proserpine, in uh, Hinduism, in Durga, the goddess mother of death. And this symbol represents a part of our own inner being, our own inner divine mother, who has the power to conquer the ego, to remove suffering. But that power only comes when we've understood it. So the process then of psychological death is to observe the I in our daily life, to be watchful of that I, to learn about that I, to see how it behaves, to see how it tries to control our actions and our thoughts and our feelings. Then we meditate. We meditate in order to extract the consciousness from the I so that then free of the ego and without any subjective filter in front of its vision, that consciousness can perceive that I as it truly is. In that way, we can understand it, we can comprehend it, and then it can be eliminated. This is the process of psychological death. When that fiery lance of the Divine Mother eradicates that ego or that afflictive emotion, the consciousness that was previously trapped in it is released. This is how we awaken. This is how the embryo of consciousness that we have, the seed, the little baby of consciousness, is grown. As the ego dies, the consciousness awakens and grows. 
This is how the Buddha nature that we have within becomes a Buddha. Through the death of the I. That death occurs according to our effort. Our effort at self-reflection. Our effort at change. And the key, most important factor in this effort is meditation. There's no way around that. The reason is, the I exists in the deep levels of the mind, which cannot be perceived with the physical senses. You have to escape the limitations of the flesh to penetrate in the confines of your own mind in order to go deep into the causes of your own suffering. The second factor is birth. Birth is that process whereby that embryo of soul, the Tathagatagarbha, the Buddhadhatu, is grown, is elaborated, where that baby, that embryo of soul, becomes a fully realized Buddha, a fully realized angel or diva. That is a process of alchemy or chemistry within which all of the elements that are within the physical body are harnessed by conscious will and are utilized in order to be of benefit, not to feed desire, not to feed sensation, but to feed the consciousness, to feed the soul. Birth is a great process whereby the butterfly emerges from the chrysalid. We are not a fully developed human being yet. We are the embryo of a human being. We have the potential to become a human being. A human being is a Buddha, an angel, someone who has developed completely all the powers of the heart, who has no afflictive emotion, no pride, no resentment, no fear. That fully developed human being has the capacity to visit and explore all the superior worlds of nature, all the other dimensions, to travel throughout all the heavens and the hells. And this power is important. It's in this way that that person, the initiate, is able to more fully investigate the nature of their own mind, to fully understand the nature of existence the nature of the I. Birth and death rely upon one another. They're two parts of one thing. We see this in life. All creatures are born, grow, develop, and die. But there's a great cycle in nature. Nature has this capacity to grow all the beautiful life forms that we see. But the spiritual birth of the soul is something that is beyond mechanical nature. Mechanical nature, or nature as it is in its visible form, is not capable of creating a Buddha. And this is why they rise so rarely. To become a fully developed human being requires self-effort. No one can do it for us. No one can save us from our karma. We're the only ones who can change ourselves and grow ourselves to become what we should be. So it's a mistaken idea to wait, to depend upon someone else, to hope for the best. It's more prudent to work, to work now, to take advantage of the opportunity that we have and to begin to give birth to that which rests within us in potential. The third factor is death, is uh, sacrifice, sorry. Sacrifice is how we give up our selfishness in order to serve others for the benefit of others. There are many forms of sacrifice, many ways that we can give and help. But the best one is called sattvic. 
Sattvic related to sattva of the three gunas, if you've studied the three gunas. And that basically means that this is a form of sacrifice or a form of karma yoga that is done without the desire for the fruits, without desire for the results. It's done simply for the sake of doing it, for the sake of giving. This is very difficult to achieve, especially for us because we're so enveloped in the ego, in the I. For us to really perform sacrifice well, we need to remove the I so that what's left is our pure consciousness, free. So we need death. But to really harness the forces of our own being, the forces of our own consciousness, we also need birth. Through the process of birth, we give rise to our solar bodies or the other vehicles of the psyche. And those vehicles give us the capacity to direct more energy. It's in this way that we can see how a great Buddha or a great master is able to accomplish such tremendous things because they have the ability to transform that much energy. And this comes through birth. Sacrifice is a necessity for us to renounce our self-will and to give for the benefit of others. And this begins, actually, in the moment we begin to renounce our own ego. The moment we begin to give up our own selfish interest and to start to behave in a way that's more accommodating to the happiness of other people. And this is what we can begin now. When we are considering a course of action, when we have an impulse to do something, usually we only measure it in accordance with what we want or what we think should be the outcome. But if we look back on our history, we see that most of the time we've been wrong. We make a lot of mistakes. So it's useful and important for us to pay attention, to not just accept what our mind tells us, but to question it, to take a step back from what the mind is saying in our intellect, from what it's saying in our heart, and what it's saying in our impulses. We need to relax we need to become conscious of our three brains and really meditate on what we intend to do. But that meditation needs to be in balance, to consider what's best for everyone, not just for me, what's best for others. This is how we start to change our karma. The synthesis of these steps, death and birth and sacrifice, is contained in every religion. The Buddha taught it very clearly. He summarized his teaching in a very short phrase when he said, adopt virtuous action, cease harmful action, and serve others. That's it. Birth and death and sacrifice. Jesus summarized them when he said, if anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself. This is death, the death of the ego. Let him take up his cross. This is birth. And let him follow after me. This is sacrifice, to em emulate the example that Jesus gave. The cross is a symbol of birth because it represents in its structure the intersection of two forces, masculine and feminine. And it's through that crossing we find the most ancient symbol of humanity, which is present in every culture, in every religion. And it's that symbol that represents how to create, how to give birth, not just physically, but also to the soul. In synthesis, then, these three factors give us a clue or a way to study any religion. Any teaching that you encounter, that you want to understand and really analyze it, look to see if they teach the three factors. Do they teach practical tools to conquer your own ego? Do they teach practical tools to give birth 
to the soul. In other words, Tantra. Do they also teach to serve others, to sacrifice? These three factors are essential. Going further, whatever religion you follow, whatever your own idiosyncrasy, if you want to awaken your consciousness, these three factors have to be balanced in your daily efforts. This is the secret, the clue, that actually produces results. They need to be balanced in our daily efforts. This means that daily, we need to be looking at ourselves to determine what in me is egotistical. What in me today is being selfish, is being self-obsessed, is being desired, desireful? What do I need to change about myself? We need to meditate on those things, to watch them, to learn about them. We also need to give birth in ourselves to virtuous activities, to give birth to the soul, to do things in a better way than we've done in the past. Most of the time, this means we need to deny our habits, to deny the way we've thought about things before, to learn something new. For any birth to occur, there has to be a death. There's no exception to this. In the course of your own existences, every time you've taken a new birth, You've come from a death. That death had to occur first in order to allow that new life to emerge. The same is true when you plant a tree. When you plant that seed, that seed contains the potential to become a tree. But in order for that to occur, that seed dies. The seed dies and out of it emerges the sprout that becomes a tree. And this is the same thing that happens with us psychologically, with our essence. Inasmuch as we die psychologically, the soul is being born, provided the elements are being given to it to accommodate that birth. On the other hand, you cannot have birth if you're not cultivating death. This is a great mistake that many spiritual aspirants make. Many people will enter into a school of Tantra, a school of transformation, and learn the techniques to transform their own psychophysical energies. And they begin to work with mantras and work with meditation practices and other transmutation practices in order to awaken their consciousness. Yet, they fail to analyze and destroy their own ego. And the result is a demon. This is how asuras are born. A demon is someone who has awakened powers, has awakened capabilities that are beyond the, the average person, and yet they still have pride, lust, anger, fear, envy. And these people we typically call black magicians, sorcerers, witches, demons. This is very common nowadays. It's very common to encounter schools and teachings that teach maybe tantra or kundalini yoga or alchemy, but they do not teach death. And so these students, unfortunately, are led into black magic. Because they awaken powers and capabilities, but they keep their ego. And the result is a failure. Someone who will encounter even greater suffering. And this is very sad. That potential is there for anyone who's working with these factors, but neglecting death. That's why in this school, we emphasize death. We place it as our highest priority. Some schools utilize the cultivation of powers as bait to draw students. These schools will say, 
come to our school and in two weeks you'll learn how to go out of your body and to travel in the astral plane. Or they'll say, in a few months, you'll awaken your kundalini. You'll awaken all your chakras. You'll experience samadhi. And they make many claims like this. But in this school, we teach techniques that will result in all of those things. But that's not our emphasis. Awakening powers can be useful. It can also be harmful. If our ego is alive and active, powers become an obstacle. They become an impediment. They become a source of suffering. Someone who still has their ego very much alive but awakens powers of clairvoyance begins to gossip begins to see things clairvoyantly about their spouse or about their friends or about other students in their school, and they begin to spread gossip about what they've seen, failing to realize that they still have their own ego, which colors and influences their vision. So they create suffering. They create harm. Death should be our emphasis. The death of the I, the death of the ego, In this way, we provide ourselves with a security measure, with a way of checking our progress to keep the eye in check at all times because it's extremely clever and extremely subtle. Sacrifice is also important, and there are some schools that emphasize karma yoga to perform a lot of service or seva. And this is good. But there are students of that tradition who believe that simply by doing a lot of good works, they will awaken consciousness and become enlightened. But this is incongruent. It doesn't add up. They can't awaken consciousness unless they awaken. You can perform all the useful actions you want, but if the ego is still alive, your useful actions will be corrupted, and the results of those actions will likewise be corrupted. You can perform all the good deeds, do all the circumambulations, do all the prostrations, serve and feed the poor, travel the world and give your life for others. And this is good. But if the ego is alive, you will die as a failure. And you'll have to come back into a new body to try again. And you'll still have karma. You may have dharma from your actions, but you will still have karma because the ego is still alive. So these three factors become very important to keep an eye on every day, to be constantly watching our own ego in everything, to always check against ourselves, to see if we're really cultivating and developing the death of our own ego and the awakening of our consciousness at the same time. As we apply these three and we learn how to balance them, what we're looking for is psychological balance, what's also called equilibrium. And this means that we have moved through effort, through learning about ourselves, out of being trapped most of the time in one of the three brains, having that psychological limp or predisposition And instead, we move our consciousness as our center of gravity. So we establish a center of gravity in the consciousness. And what that means is that most of the time, we are conscious. We are aware of the three brains and able to watch them and keep an eye on them, to watch our body and speech and mind, to do things consciously with awareness as much as we're capable of it. This situation, this phenomena, comes through effort. It does not arise mechanically. Nature cannot do it. And no person outside of you can do it. No one can give you this experience. You have to create it yourself. And it comes through these three factors. Through the death of bad habits, the death of desires, through the birth of new actions, like self-observation, and through the sacrifice of your self-will. When those three are starting to balance, 
and they become firmly established, psychological equilibrium becomes a reality. And this is when the magic begins. This is when happiness starts to arrive. True happiness is a state of consciousness. It's a state of nirvana. It's a state and experience that does not depend on external circumstances, but depends exclusively on the awakening of consciousness. Anyone in the world can do this. Whatever your circumstances, however great your suffering, however terrible your life might be, you can awaken your consciousness and equilibrate your three brains and taste nirvana, taste happiness. And you can go beyond that. You can conquer your ego. You can give birth to the soul. And you can help others. This is our birthright. All, that require, all that's required is that we want to do it. And we make the effort every day consistently, without fail. Of course, that's the hard part. This state of happiness that I'm describing has another word. And it's a word that's very much misused in our society. It is the word love. The state of happiness is the state of real love, conscious love, cognizant love. This is a state of consciousness that is expressing the beauty of Christ. It is light. It is free of I, free of self, free of condition. It is a simple state of being that is expressed as bodhicitta, or great love, compassion. And it's a state of consciousness that has many levels, again, on this tree of life. When we acquire and develop within ourselves psychological equilibrium, we start to taste that. And it can be in the most mundane circumstances that we begin to feel what this real love means, and what the real love is. It is a quality of gratitude, a quality of generosity that has no conditions and that is accompanied by great serenity and peace. It is indescribable and it is unmistakable. And when you taste it, you'll understand that everything you've sought in all of your previous existences that you thought was happiness, we're all mistaken. And real happiness was waiting inside, nestled within your very heart, the noose atom, the atom of Christ, Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Yin, that link that provides the channel or the media through which that energy can express in our three brains. This form of love is so beautiful, so incredible, it is inexpressible. And all the poets who've sung of true love have all lamented their inability to express it. It's accompanied by sadness, though. And this is why when we study the Buddhas and the prophets and we sense and hear and feel the great love that they express and the great happiness they express, they also express their concern for others, their compassion for others. And we see the actions of the bodhisattvas who sacrifice themselves so terribly for others because they want others to experience that love, to taste that, to understand it. 
this form of consciousness is unique within every person. It has its own idiosyncrasy, its own expression, its own identity, yet it is beyond the eye. It radiates from Chokmah, the second Logos, the Christ. And in that sphere, there is no individuality. There is no I. There is no self. But there is love. There is intelligence. There is wisdom. And there is a vast compassion. But it is not individual in the way we think of it, but more like a supra-individuality something beyond the way we think of self. This is part of the reason that in Buddhism, the doctrine of no self is so emphasized. But it's part of the reason why the Buddha taught it after he taught about karma and the skandhas and all the other psycho-aggregates that make up who we are. I had this experience one time where I was suffering very much in a situation in life. And the situation was creating so much pain for me that I couldn't push through it. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't resolve it. And so my suffering was increasing. And I had the good fortune to encounter a Lama, a Tibetan Lama, who simply said to me, what I are you talking about? And that was all I had to hear. From that little clue, I returned to meditation and meditated and meditated on that suffering that I was experiencing and saw there was no I. That I was a delusion. It was an illusionary I that I had created, but yet did not have any reality. I had allowed it to take control of my three brains. And when I was meditating on that, the true state of its existence became apparent to me. And that suffering dissolved. And I felt equanimity and peace. And for me, in those moments, this was a miracle. I had been suffering so intensely for a long time because of that one element that I couldn't see before. But if you just heard this and said, well, this doesn't make any sense. It seems contradictory. How can I comprehend there is no I? It doesn't make sense to the intellect but to the consciousness it does. When you really meditate on yourself, you meditate on your experiences, you start to comprehend what mystical death really means and why the Buddha taught the doctrine of no self. Part of what we can do is to analyze those experiences that cause suffering for us and to analyze it in terms of these three factors. When we find ourselves in a situation of suffering, we need to look at what's producing the suffering. And usually we'll find that that suffering is dependent on circumstances, circumstances that are impermanent and are subject to change. But sometimes they're not subject to change from us. Like, for example... If your, your mom or your dad is creating a lot of suffering for you, you can't necessarily get out of the house. You might be too young. So how do you resolve that? You meditate. You comprehend how your own mind is reacting to those circumstances and how that reaction is up to you. It's up to how you transform the impression of those circumstances. This is the key. In that moment, 
when your parent is doing something that would normally be painful, if you can perceive that experience, the external event, consciously and simultaneously observe your internal state consciously, you start to see their relationship as a matter of willpower. And it's up to you how you react. Which parts of your psyche you allow to come forward is up to you. Most of the time, though, we're so lazy as a consciousness, we react mechanically, habitually, and we get upset. With some strength in the consciousness by performing these practices, little by little we gain enough strength consciously to manage our internal state, no matter what the external circumstances can be. And in this way, we begin to enact the process of birth and death and sacrifice in the moment. So if our parent was saying something harmful or hurtful to us, maybe in past times we would have reacted with anger to hurt them back. But with some conscious development in us, we can learn how to receive those impressions and not react. This is a sacrifice because we have to give up our own will for revenge to make things equal in the eyes of the ego to make them pay for hurting us. It's also a form of death. When we stop feeding that ego, when we stop letting it control us, that ego starts to die. But it's also a form of birth because we're strengthening our consciousness to act. We're giving birth to a new action, to a new way of dealing with life. So these three factors are incorporated in that instant but can only happen if we pay attention. If we really are paying attention and we're really meditating on those things which cause us pain or cause pain for others. It's through this process, continually, through every event of life, that we start to transform life. But you see the key? We're not seeking to change external circumstances. We're seeking to change our internal landscape. When we change internally, external circumstances will change automatically. That's the nature of life. When we change, everything outside changes. And this is what the Buddha did. This is what Jesus did. This is what Moses did. They changed themselves. And in doing that, they became a completely developed human being who then had awakened consciousness and the capacity to really help other people. Do you have any questions? So your question is, which brain do you start with when you're yeah. meditating on an event? In my personal opinion, I would say, follow your intuition. We all have certain tendencies related to the three brains. We may be a little more emotional or intellectual than, than, nor, than otherwise, right? But knowing that doesn't give you the ability to comprehend all your egos. I think, in my experience, it's been more useful to analyze each situation independently. To not look in my three brains for how it behaved, but look into the scenario, into the action. As an example, if I had you know, a disagreement with someone and it was painful and I said things that I regret, I wouldn't immediately start to meditate on that by analyzing 
let's say, an emotional center, which you would think would be the problem because of an emotional regret, right? Instead, I would start to look at the scenario, the scene, the event, and to not see it from myself, from my selfish point of view, but to see it from the eyes of the other person. And I'm saying it in this way in order to help myself get a little objectivity. Part of what can occur when you're doing any kind of psychoanalytical meditation on yourself is you can immediately become re-identified with an event, especially if it was an emotional nature or a sexual nature. And the result will be that you'll lose your objectivity, your ability to see that event as if you were just an actor. You follow what I'm saying? So while we may have tendencies in relation to the three, brain, three brains, and while each ego may tend to work towards or through one brain more than another, I think for myself it's more helpful to look at the scene in a more holistic way, to not just focus on the emotional part. The emotional part might be the most obvious part, but it's not necessarily the key to unravel it. And just to repeat, my own approach is to try to see the event in a way that I haven't seen it before. I've, I've talked with some students who begin to get the impression that they may be, let's say, an intellectual type of person. So when they have a conflict or some kind of event they want to meditate on, they'll immediately start to look at that event as an intellectual event. And this is a shortcoming it prevents them from seeing how the other two brains contributed to that event and also other factors, other circumstances that contributed. You see my point? So I'm just saying I think it's better to back up a little bit. Yeah, but, uh, you wouldn't condemn yourself for the action, would you? Like to ignite the other side of it? No. No. There's a key thing about condemnation. It's easy for us to condemn ourselves, but it's a mistake. When we're observing ourselves, we have to observe impartially. When we're in meditation, we have to meditate impartially. This is very difficult, but when you start to experience how the consciousness really functions, you realize why it's important. The consciousness itself has the capacity to be impartial, to be serene or um, distinct from the egotistical event. And that distinction is so critical because if we begin to condemn or judge our behavior, we tend to do that with an ego. Maybe it's an ego of self-deprecation or shame. Maybe it's an ego of pride. Maybe it's an ego of fear. But the ego cannot conquer the ego. It cannot. So in our self-observation and in our meditation, we have to develop the ability to be impartial judges. The condemnation comes once we start to understand what conscious judgment means. And this has nothing to do with the ego. It's something different. There are three gunas that are described in Hinduism. Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. Sattva is related to harmony or balance. Rajas is related to passion or energy. And Tamas is related to inertia. So a sattvic sacrifice would be a sacrifice that was done in harmony and balance, which means no ego, no I no sense of self, something that's done purely for the sake of giving. And this is very well put in the Bhagavad Gita. If you read the words of Krishna to Arjuna, he explains how to perform action. He says, do everything for the sake of me without desiring the fruits of action. That is sattvic sacrifice. That's how you give to others without desiring the fruits of 
So for example, some people go into karma yoga because they want to make their karma better. But that's not sattvic. You see? To give simply for the sake of giving without expectation requires that the ego is not there. And so first you have to remove the ego. Rajasic or tamasic sacrifice are both other qualities of sacrificing which are done in egotistical fashion. A rajasic sacrifice would be something done with a lot of passion and a lot of energy, but with desire for results. With wanting to be recognized, wanting to be praised, wanting to receive the benefit. Where tamasic would be a sacrifice that was done without any consciousness, without any real attentiveness, done mechanically. Like the way many people perform rituals and sacrifices in religions nowadays. They do them mechanically, habitually. They'll say their Hail Marys a thousand times or they'll say their Guru Mantra a thousand times, but without any consciousness. This is tamasic. Any other questions? The question is about laziness as a consciousness. Well, when we talk about egos or eyes, we, we generally see the same duality of the pendulum. So when we talk about pride, for example, pride is not just feeling puffed up or having an, an overdeveloped sense of confidence. Pride is also shame. Self-hate is a form of pride. Depression, actually, is a form of pride. So when we say pride, what we're talking about is the belief in an I or the empowerment of a false I. Now, laziness is also an egotistical state that has a duality and it has many qualities and ranges. Usually when we think of laziness, we think of someone who's just lying around all the time and doesn't do anything. But that's only one face of laziness. People who are hyperactive, who are workaholics, are very lazy. They might be busy physically, but their consciousness is completely asleep. And they just do everything mechanically, habitually, driven by desires. This is a form of laziness. So when we say that the consciousness is lazy, it's because it's asleep and because it doesn't have any strength. To awaken the consciousness means to make it active, to make it function. The consciousness in us now is inactive. We think we're awake, but we're not. We're not awake. We're asleep. And we have to come to grips with that, to realize that. That we're going from day to day enveloped in a sphere of dreams, projections, and illusions. And these are what we think is our self. This thing, this voice that we hear, the mind that we're always listening to, the images that are always appearing on the screen of our mind, the different desires and impulses that are always fluctuating within us, are all illusion. And they all produce the sleep of the consciousness. To make it worse, TV, internet, music, going to clubs, going to parties, and all these other things that we do don't help us to awaken. They help us to sleep. They keep us dreaming. They keep us fantasizing. They keep us from penetrating into the truth of who we really are. From family event to family event, from school to marriage to having kids to death, we dream. And this is why the poets say life is but a dream. It is, as long as the consciousness sleeps. And in us, it sleeps. There is only one way to awaken the consciousness by self-effort. Not a single master can awaken your consciousness for you. You can study at the foot of Jesus or Buddha, 
They cannot awaken your consciousness. And they will tell you that. Only you can. And you can do it now. The consciousness that you have has within it the potential to become a Buddha if you use it, if you awaken it. But if you ignore it, then it's lazy. It's asleep, and it will stay asleep. Nothing can be done for the one who wants to stay asleep. They will sleep through the centuries, through eons, and they will just suffer. And that's what we've all been doing. From existence to existence, repeating the same tragedies, only each time it gets more complicated. There's another question. Yes. The question is, we have, I said that we have to practice impartially while in the books of Samael and Vior, he states we have to practice with burning faith. Both are true. Both are true. The burning faith, you have to understand what faith means to know what that means. Faith is not belief. People in these times mistake faith with belief. But faith is experience. Direct, conscious, awakened experience. And this is what faith actually means. If you look into the roots of the word, it was changed in recent times in order to hide this. We have to practice with burning faith, which means with effort, continual, persistent, consistent effort. That is burning faith. When a torch is burning, the flame is erupting and it doesn't stop until everything that's combustible is consumed. This is how we have to practice. And the combustible is our ego. We have to practice intensely, continually, without ever stopping. Yet, we have to be impartial and when I say impartially, it doesn't mean without caring. It means without judging ourselves as good or bad. Without taking sides as a consciousness. This is a very subtle thing to grasp because our intellect always wants to take sides. Good or bad, A or B. And our Emotional sitter always wants to take sides. Yes or no. I believe it or I don't. It feels good or it feels bad. And the same is true in our motor instinctive sexual brain. We always want to take sides for or against. But this is the pendulum of the mind. If you really want to reach the Tao, which is the center of balance, the middle path that the Buddha taught, psychological equilibrium, you have to be firmly established between the two extremes, neither for nor against, impartial, making effort but without judgment. Here's why. As soon as you start to take a side for or against, you start to reject the other side. And that leads to not seeing it. This is what leads, in one case, it can lead to mythomania, to psychological pride, to, to spiritual pride. For example, there are people who start to meditate on themselves and start to, according to their view, to take sides with the consciousness or with the being. And they begin to build this concept that their being is a certain master or God. And so this sounds very helpful, right? to say, well, my inner being is a god, so I'm going to take the side of my inner being and I'm going to condemn my ego. But here's the problem. They make an I out of that belief. They make an I out of the idea that they are a certain incarnated master 
or their God or their inner being is such and such great angel. And they make an I out of it. They make an ego. And they persist in saying, I'm on the side of my God and I'm condemning my ego. But they do not persist on the path because they have immediately walked off towards the left, the left side. And this is mythomania. To be impartial means to never accept the existence of an I. Never. Even the Buddha, the Buddha Shakyamuni, who achieved the development of the Trikayas, who reached very high levels of realization, never said he was anyone. He was asked if he was a god, and he said no. He said he was a man who was awake. And that's all. This is to be impartial. To make effort, but to be impartial. There's another question. question is about the difference between someone with and someone without ego and their abilities to make sacrifices. Well, if you're learning how to swim and you try to go swimming with a suit of armor on, you're going to have a really hard time because it's so heavy and it encumbers you. If you take off the armor and you go swimming with nothing, you'll swim easily. And it's the same with sacrifice. The ego is a burden. It conditions everything. Even when we think it doesn't, even when we can't see it, it's there until it's completely dead. The difference is clear. Someone without the armor, of, you know, the suit of armor on can swim a long way and fast. Someone with a suit of armor can't go very far and is at risk of drowning. So while you have an ego, you still must make effort. You have to try, but you have to be prudent. And this is a very important thing. There are, in, in every religion and every group and every school, the students are taught about how to sacrifice. Uh, sometimes they're taught to tithe, to give a portion of their income to the church or to the monastery or the group. Sometimes they're taught to perform seva or selfless service. So they'll come and wash dishes or clean the temple or things like that. Sometimes students are encouraged to come and participate in programs or to assist the needy, uh, even to teach. The problem comes when we have the intention to do something we make an agreement to do it, and we don't do it. This is a problem, and it's true in every school. Being prudent means knowing how to measure the resistance of our own ego. We know we need to make sacrifices in order to perform the three factors. Being prudent means choosing a sacrifice that we can fulfill. This is really true of anything in life. If you want to succeed in business, only make agreements that you can fulfill. If you make a lot of promises and you don't fulfill them, your business will fail. The same is true spiritually. If you make the intention or the promise or the agreement to perform a certain duty, do it. If you fail to, people will lose faith in you. They won't believe you. And worse, you'll have acquired karma. Because usually when someone's depending on us to do something, they need it. They're waiting for it. And if we don't do it, we put that other person or that group into a bad position. Therefore, when we have ego, let us be intelligent 
about the kinds of sacrifice that we perform. Choose things that you can achieve, that you can fulfill and complete. And if you make an agreement, fulfill it. If you cannot, do your best to solve it. Find someone else to do it, or at least communicate with the person you made the agreement with. Any other questions? Okay, the question is, does the person benefit more when they sacrifice while having ego because they're sacrificing desire? No. The law is like this. Everything is judged on the result. That's it. The result is what acquires the fruit. Yeah, the phrase, the, the, the motto of Gnosis is telema, which means willpower. But this is related to the Lord's Prayer, which says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the occult side of it is, do what thou wilt, but know that you will be measured for all of your deeds. What this means is that we have to perform the actions that we feel are important for us to perform and do them accordance to the will of God. But we're measured on the result of the action, not on our intentions. We may mean well, but if we cause harm, we will be judged based on that. And the law is like that, impartial. With love, with compassion, but impartial. This is why we always see justice as a goddess with a blindfold and a scale. The blindfold shows the law is impartial no matter what level you are in your spiritual development. You're judged on the results of your action, not on your intentions. An example would be, I heard a story about a person who uh, asked Samael and Vior about an event that happened in Mexico. Apparently, there was a person who was driving a car and struck and killed some children and left the scene and later felt so much remorse and pain because of their mistake that they turned themselves into the police and was truly remorseful for having committed such a horrible action. And... According to the circumstances and the nature of the law in that place and time, this person didn't suffer much at the hands of the municipal court. And yet this person, a student, asked Samael and Vior about this event and said, is that it? I mean, do they just get off based on that? And the master Samael said, no, absolutely not. They will pay for that action, period. There are no exceptions. Now, the way we pay is negotiable. Nonetheless, we are judged for the result of our action, not whether we intended it or not. So one of the things about Gnosis that is, that is very helpful is that uh, we learn techniques to negotiate karma, to manage karma. But we all have terrible karma all of us. But when we apply these three factors and begin to work to awaken our consciousness, we can start to receive extra help to consciously negotiate our own karma. Yes, the question. No. The question is about the factor of sacrifice. Is it only to acquire dharma? Um, to fully answer that question, I would suggest that you study the course, the path of the Bodhisattva, to fully understand the nature of sacrifice. But in synthesis, the law of Christ, which is the light of the Okidanok, Avalokiteshvara, the simple singular expression of that light is love. But love in itself is sacrifice. 
And that light is born and manifests itself into all the other dimensions of existence and sacrifices itself in every atom in order to allow life to emerge. When we enter into a spiritual path, our goal is to complete our development as a human being, to become a complete human being. But a complete human being is a light bulb or a receptacle that receives that pure light of love and transmits it. And that love is sacrifice itself. The purpose of the third factor is to learn, for the consciousness to learn how to become one with Christ, with that light. And this is something that the intellect really can't grasp because the true meaning of it is beyond the realm of the intellect or the emotion. It's something that you have to see and experience consciously to understand. Any other questions? To close the lecture, I would like to encourage you to take advantage of these psychological tools. They are not merely theoretical. When you learn how to utilize your own consciousness and to learn how to apply the three factors, you can enter into your own personal, direct experience of the truth. This is something that is the reason for life. It's the reason we're born. This is not something that you just have to believe in, to accept or reject. This type of information is given so that we will use it. And we'll use it not only to benefit ourselves, but to benefit our society. And ultimately, this is the point of sacrifice. It isn't to gain dharma. It isn't to advance ourselves spiritually. It's to help our human family, to help everyone, not just the ones we know, but to help everyone. We can't do that while the eye is alive. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, I